Well, and thank you again, Leslie, and the leadership team for inviting me back to, uh, to talk this morning. What a great opportunity to see a lot of friends and hopefully new friends here. So, and, uh, and I'm really excited that C3 has got this focus on um, Earth ethos and Terra. I think it's an incredibly important and timely thing. Um, so Leslie suggested that I start by telling you a little bit about myself, about my story. I was like, well, I don't know if my story is that interesting, but let's go with what my story actually starts. Uh, maybe with a common thread. Did I see that our musicians came up here from Nashville? Is that me too? A while back, though, <laughs> I, I came to uh, Grand Valley State University in 1992 after finishing my uh, my studies at Vanderbilt, which is in Nashville, which is a great city, and love to go back there and visit sometimes. Uh, my background, my academic training is in philosophy. Yeah, the, the very abstract, esoteric stuff. And I, uh, I have always been, you know, kind of conflicted by that uh, for various reasons. I, I, you know, I'm fascinated with all of, the, all of that, uh, you know, academic part of it. But I've always thought that, you know, look, if philosophers manage now and then to come up with a good idea or clarify something and make the world less confusing, shouldn't that somehow get put into practice. Shouldn't that have some application? So I've, I've always thought that was the case. And specifically, I've always thought that philosophy could be helpful in the ways that we conduct ourselves toward the natural world, toward the environments that support us. Uh, so to make my story, you know, hopefully fairly short and, and mercifully not too boring, uh, I got involved back in the 1980s in environmental ethics, the academic discipline, and I found it very dissatisfying because it didn't seem to be making much of a difference in the world. It, it was kind of stereotypically bad philosophy in my opinion. So I looked for, for some alternatives and sure enough, there were some other academic philosophers around the country and around the world who were thinking in a similar mindset and, and long story short, we did propose a different framework where, where philosophical thinking could help inform people's understanding and action toward the natural world. Uh, this, uh, in 1996, this all got published in a collection called Environmental Pragmatism. Uh, and I, you know, you, you write a book, you write a chapter, you put it out in the world, and you don't know if anybody pays any attention to it. You know, the world doesn't change the next day. You do, you do the work and you go on. Uh, so then I faced this problem, I was like, well, what is the next thing? How, how do, you know, if we worked out these problems, how do we put that into application? And for me, that took the form of, well, let's rethink what we're doing at the university in terms of equipping people, equipping students to think in a good way about the kinds of problems we're confronting concerning the environment, and more importantly, how to take some effective action. So that's what I've been working on uh, at Grand Valley since, uh, especially since a little before 2007. And this has led to the environmental studies, environmental and sustainability studies program, which is built on uh, a notion that we need to have systemic thinking about problems and we need to figure out effective action. And so today's talk title is Wicked Problems and the Mystery of Effective Action. I see a few people here who I think are probably familiar with William James College. Let's, let's see some hands if you, okay, the, the idea lives on. We are, we are still looking for that magic formula of deeply informed, reflective, and effective action. So for those of you who are familiar with that, here's a bit of an update. Uh, here's the problem, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna frame this in terms of a, a problem first and then a solution or two. The problem is that environmental issues, you know, pick your favorite one, I'm not gonna highlight any one for you because they ultimately all connect anyway. Uh, these are wicked problems, and I mean a specific thing by that. This is a distinction that goes back 30 or 40 years in urban planning of all places. There are tame problems. So a year or so back, uh, noticed some water was leaking in different parts of my house. 
the living room, the uh, dining room, the bedroom, the hallway. <laughs> this is a problem. <laughs> the question is, what kind of problem is this? Well, it's a tame problem. And by that I mean, I have a specific thing I can observe, uh, I know the nature of the problem, and there's a good solution that's pretty straightforward. The solution is a new roof. <laughs> now, that's not to say that the solution to a tame problem is going to be cheap. <laughs> it wasn't. Uh, it's not that it doesn't require expertise. We had to get you know, a professional crew who knew how to, how to rebuild a roof. And, but the point, the point that makes it tame is specific thing is happening, we can replace the roof, do this one big expensive thing, and the problem goes away. Yay! Wicked problems are not like that. Wicked problems are specifically, and I'm not going to get into this, but there's a list of like 10 different features, but the, the issue with wicked problems, and think in terms of the big ones, poverty, crime, education, uh, unemployment, large-scale social problems are typically wicked problems. And if you're thinking of that little list that I just threw out there, poverty, crime, education, unemployment, you start to realize these are probably all interconnected. There's no one way to solve one of them. There's no single thing you can do. You can't hire somebody like a roofer to come in and just fix it. They all connect to each other. Uh, you're probably never going to completely solve the problem. You're probably going to be better off thinking in terms of, well, we made some progress here and we can look back and see that the things we did have made things better. Uh, maybe they didn't, then we need to really rethink what we're doing. Right, that's characteristic of a wicked problem. They tend to be incredibly frustrating and incredibly common. Pick the environmental problem of your choice, it's a wicked problem. There is no one cause. There's no one solution. So that's the first issue we face you know, as, as an educator trying to figure out how do we prepare people to do this. Uh, the problems are wicked, not tame. The second point is they're urgent. We, for, for some environmental issues, we need solutions in fairly short order. Uh, some we can let ride for a little while but nonetheless, we would like to address them because they are problems. So there's an urgency here. And finally, and this is where the, uh, this is where the quote, we cannot solve our problems with the same thinking we use to create them. By the way, that should be attributed to the internet, as far as I can tell. I don't, nobody apparently ever said this, not Einstein anyway. But it's a great thought. Uh, how do you think about a different way to think? You see the problem here. So here we are traversing these swamps of wicked problems, not sure which way we're going, not sure that we're ever going to get out of it. But that's also where all the really interesting stuff in the world happens, is in swamps. And uh, so it's an incredibly rich and promising area to work. But what's a framework for communicating to students or for understanding for ourselves the kind of thing that is, is needed. And I, I came across and have relied very heavily on the work, here comes the philosophy part, on the work of Hannah Arendt, a um, great German-American philosopher uh, who was at the University of Chicago for many years. Her book, The Human Condition, introduces an idea that I find really, really helpful. Uh, without going into the full details, she makes an important distinction between two ways that we go about doing things. One is as work. And work typically is a tame problem. Right? We need to build you know, 25 step ladders here in the factory before Friday. There's some certain things we need to do. And at the end of the process on Friday, we'll know if we did it or not. We'll know if the ladders are right. So it's work. It's following a predetermined plan. And it's very important in a lot of the world consists of work. She lays that out so as to say there's another thing human, humans are capable of, and it's a specifically social thing. And it, it's what she calls action. And it's, as my title suggests, a little mysterious. I put this to my students in terms of what's involved in a civic action, in doing something in your community, in your society, 
that actually makes a difference, that takes us some steps forward toward addressing a wicked problem. What would it be to do something about, say, PFAS contamination in the waterways? Right? Wicked problem, lots of factors. What power do we as citizens have to do something about a problem with that? Well, action is the crucial thing here. I define it as an open-ended public project that uses speech and persuasion to coordinate people's efforts. This is always multiple people with the effect of reconfiguring the existing social relations and purposes and creates a possibility for new ones. So I promise that's the only theoretical definition you're getting today. The crucial thing here is we are changing the social arrangements around a problem so as to make new things possible. Okay? And that is the way forward on wicked problems. Well, all right, how do you put this into practice? Our, our program is what I refer to as a third generation environmental studies program, first generation being biological sciences and ecology. This, this developed all over in the 70s and, and advanced our understanding greatly. A little after that, you see uh, the addition of public policy studies and economics into the picture so that we are graduating lots of very capable people who understand the science and the policy. Well, I'm a philosopher and an old English major, and I'm the one who picked the crazy Mary Oliver poem. So I think the humanities and the arts have an important role in this that we're just now starting to recognize. So the first thing is that in order to address these problems, you need to be conversant with a lot of different perspectives, not just the science, not just the policy, but also the cultural, the people side of this. How do we reach an audience to organize them around an issue that they care about, to educate them, and to motivate them to act? Uh, one of the best answers is music. Okay? So you're, you're doing the world's work here. Uh, there are some other tools that we want to introduce, though. So it's, it's an interdisciplinary program. A um, couple of other things that we include. And how am I doing on time here? I don't. Oh, great. <laughs> so I won't just gloss over this. A couple of the key pieces that we put into the mix, uh, and these are somewhat formal ways of thinking, right? Getting back to the, to the not Einstein, we don't know who it was, quote, uh, ways of thinking that are different from the ways that got us here. So systems thinking is one crucial part of getting a handle on these problems. Uh, wicked problems, are not linear problems. That's one of their most important features. It's not a hole in the roof that I can fix with a new roof. Uh, wicked problems are often systemic. And if we step in and do the obvious common sense thing to solve the problem, we may actually trigger something in a more system-wide uh, scale that causes a bunch of other problems that weren't even there before. The classic example is, uh, uh, so we've got an insect that's eating our crops, and this is a bad thing. We, want, we would like that insect to not be eating our crops because we want to eat our crops. And so we find a, a pesticide that takes care of, let's call it the little red insect that's eating our crops. So we, we find a pesticide that will take care of the little red insect, and we go in and we kill every one of those little red insects. Crop yields go up. Little red insects aren't eating our crops. Yay. Until next year. And this, actually, this is a hypothetical example, but this kind of thing happens all the time. The next year, we go out and we realize that there's even less of our crop than there was when we were dealing with the little red insects. What the heck is going on? We get out, we take a look, and we discover, where did all these little blue insects come from? <laughs> What the heck are they? Well, they're the opportunistic ones, different species that were hanging out somewhere else until we wiped out all the little red, little red insects and opened up a space for them. And here come the little blue ones who may be even worse than what we were dealing with. So it's a systemic mistake in our solution. We thought what we needed to do was get rid of the, get rid of the red insects, 
But no, actually what we needed to do was something a little different, which I guess I would describe as protecting our crop from all the insects that want to eat it. So by not recognizing the nature of the problem, we ended up creating a bigger one. And that's a, actually a fairly simple example of the way systems thinking can help you understand a problem. Uh, the point being that it's often the case that we're not dealing with a linear, you know, one cause, one effect kind of situation, but there are a lot of other things going on. So we, we look at the way environmental problems may be produced by describable, identifiable systems, and then we figure out where can we step in and maybe alter the dynamics a little bit. The second feature that we, we highlight a lot with our students, and, and by the way, these students are working in teams, collaborative teams, addressing real issues usually with community partners. I've got a couple of student projects working here in Grand Haven on various waste management right now. Uh, this brings a level of, of reality and urgency to the student's education that is, you know, can't be simulated, right? It, it's the real deal. So the second thing that we, we encourage and, and urge on students is to use what's called the design thinking framework. And this is kind of a, to be honest, kind of a recent, oh my gosh, this is a great new thing. It's not a terribly new thing, but the, the term design thinking is kind of new. Uh, the gist of it is that when we're addressing one of these wicked problems, when we're addressing one of these non-linear systemic pr problems that's ending up with you know, polluted air or polluted water or, or whatever the problem may be, there's probably no single expert out there who has the answer. There's probably not even a collection of four or five individual experts out there who are going to be able to come up with the right answer. Various reasons for this, one being these problems always have their little local unique weirdnesses to them. Okay? Uh, poverty in Texas may be very, very different from poverty in South Dakota and from you know, the Parisian suburbs, even though there are some similarities. So, so there's no expert. So how do you do this? Well, you have to enlist the help of every non-expert who has knowledge about the situation that you can. And so the design thinking process, very briefly, says, all right, we've got a problem. Let's try and, try and define it as best we can so we know what we're doing. Now let's go empathize is the term usually you see. I like the term listen. Uh, let's go ask the people who have this problem what they think about it. I mean, do they consider it a problem, first of all? If so, why? Does anybody, you know, affected by this problem, have they found their own workaround already? Very often somebody out there has figured out how to get around this, and it's just a matter of, of figuring out, you know, can everybody do that? Uh, that's, that's great because somebody's already solved the problem. That's less common though. Usually what happens is you go and you get a lot of input about the nature of the problem, what people's concerns are, how they understand it, and then you go back and you completely redefine your original problem because you didn't understand it until you went out and talked to people. Right? And then it's a process of working through some, some kind of predictable steps. Well, you propose some solutions, you get more feedback, you determine based on that which solution looks the most promising, you prototype it, you try it out on a small scale in some way, and if that looks like a good, a good approach, we go ahead and try to implement it. But then the whole process, because these are wicked problems, right? No, no ultimate single solution is gonna cover everything. Then typically the process starts over at some point. You say, all right, we, we have made progress and now we're in a different situation. Can we make some more progress on a different front? And it, it goes on. So what students take away from this is that their research, which goes into this, and their efforts to implement a solution, that is to, to start an action, uh, are a process. A describable process, it's not a random process, but these are a process and it's through 
just going ahead and embracing that process that you make a real difference. A couple of quick examples of what we're talking about. One of the first things I have my students read is an account of a, a woman named Terry Swearingen, who is in East Liverpool, Ohio, worked from 1983 to 1997, so 14 years. Um, she was a mom and a, and a nurse and you know community member, and uh, there were plans all of a sudden to build a toxic waste incinerator in this community. As a mom and a nurse, she kind of looked at that and said, gee, I wonder if that could have any negative health effects for anybody. And as she began to research it, she discovered they were building it about a thousand yards from a school. Right, you know the story, even if you don't know this story. A, a, what looked to be a very, very bad decision for the people of Liverpool, of East Liverpool. A long story short, and it's, I very much encourage you to look up the story of Terry Swearingen and her campaign. Uh, after 14 years, she is acknowledged you know, around the world with all kinds of honors as a great environmental activist, as a real role model, as a success story, in spite of the fact that that plant got built. <laughs> what? What's going on? I mean, isn't this just a clear loss? That one got built, but no other toxic waste incinerators of that style have been licensed since. So rather than the hundreds that very well would have appeared on the countryside, uh, there is this one. Right? There's a really important lesson in there for anyone who undertakes a civic action is what counts as success is very hard to predict. You really are going to have to look back in retrospect after the work is done to determine whether what you did was a success or how it came out. This again gets back to the notion of action as unpredictable, as, in Thoreau's word, wild, right? It's not in our control. But it's because of that unpredictability, because people take it up, because it goes in different directions, goes viral, as we might say today, uh, it can actually have miraculous effect. I'm sure that if somebody went back to you know, Terry Swearingen and her group in 1983 and said, you know, because of what you're doing here, uh, there will only ever be one more of these plants built, they wouldn't have thought that was possible. But no, we're just trying to focus on our community, just do this one. The bigger effect was enormous. Um, a happier example, in the very first version of trying to see if this would actually work with students or whether it would just be a chaotic disaster that would end my career, <laughs> I, had, uh, I had one one student group work with Grand Valley's administration to see if they could get permission to establish a community garden. They met with administrators and lawyers and risk management people and human resources people, they went to more meetings than I would wish on anybody, right? All through the winter, starting in January, and by the end of April, they had not set foot on the ground where this garden would be, but they had written permission to use a tiny little chunk of land about the size of the middle part of this room uh, to establish some community garden plots. They had permission to do that for one year because the university was planning to use that, that property to build a, an equipment storage shed. That's why they had bought it. Uh, but they weren't going to do that right away. Well, if you happen to be, so fast forward 11 years, they got permission, they, they got their friends out that summer and they planted some garden plots and it was really fun. And I think they, they grew a carrot. <laughs> I have a... I have a picture of the first carrot to come out of the plot. Uh, it was not what you'd look at as a resounding success, although they learned an enormous amount about how you do this. Now think an action that reconfigures social relations and makes new relations possible. Fast forward 11 years, that little garden project is now a four acre working student run farm that is 
not quite, it's not designed to be entirely financially self-sustaining, but it employs anywhere from four to six interns who are paid, uh, sells food at the farmer's market, sells food to a CSA membership, and donates food to the on-campus uh, student food pantry. We have parts of national uh, biofuel research program going on at the site. We teach two classes exclusively out there. We get something like 200 volunteers a semester coming out. To, I, nobody envisioned this, but they just did the work and waited, and more people came on. So that's the success story. Well, uh, Leslie is giving me the time's up schedule sign here, so uh, I look forward to following up on this with you in the, in the talk back, and I guess I'm going to leave you with the mystery of effective action is that sometimes it really works. All right, thank you.